When your family gets broken apart when you're a kid, it can imprint you with a broken picture of what's possible for you in relationships, especially when you form your own relationships with a partner or start your own family. And when parents are too preoccupied with their drama and their pain, they don't perceive the reality of what you needed as a kid. And that emotional emptiness can get so desperate that when you're old enough to get some kind of boyfriend or girlfriend, you merge with the first person who comes along. And this can seriously slow your emotional development, especially after what you went through as a kid. Or you can be a bad influence on your partner and they on you. You can amplify each other's pain from the past. And it can make healing for everybody impossible. And at that point, everything depends on at least one partner having the wisdom to break the cycle. Now, breakups are messy, but somehow, one way or another, that intense dance of jealousy and punishment and pushing people away and pulling them back in, it has to stop if either of you is going to heal. So if you're the one in that relationship, regardless of how it's going to affect the other people, your healing depends very much on doing whatever you need to do to stop that emptiness and anger and become capable of a real relationship. My letter today is from someone I'll call Angie, and she writes, Dear Anna, I'm a 32-year-old single mother of a five-year-old son with my ex who I was with for seven years. We broke up when my son was turning three. Our relationship started off very intense. We were both young, semi-outcasted from our families, him worse than me. He had a young mother and never knew his father growing up and bounced from family members' houses. I lived with my single mother. I have memories of my mom fighting about my sibling's mother who my dad cheated on my mom for. My half-brother is a month younger than me. For some context, growing up, I was in the middle of my mom and my dad and my sibling's mom who treated us so good, but I felt wrong liking her. Jump forward, me and my ex met. I liked him, but I wasn't sure how much or how serious I was about him until I found him talking to other girls. It made me feel like I needed him and wanted to be serious. Yes, I know this is unhealthy. I've got the fairy pencil here. This is where I circle things I want to come back to. I'm going to read it all the way through, and I'll come back to the things I circled so I can try to help you. Okay, Angie. Here we go. I began to feel super insecure after this, and the cycle began of insecurity, jealousy, resentment, and him getting caught over and over, me taking, back, taking him back over and over. This went on for years and got worse each time until he cheated and got a girl pregnant and had a daughter. He begged me to stay. I wanted to stay because of how bad it hurt me to be out with him and this girl having a baby. Out of hurt, spite, jealousy, I told him I wanted us to have a baby. And we did. The other girl basically cut him off when, we did, when he did not choose to be with her. Things seemed to get better during pregnancy, but he was still cheating and I still didn't leave. I knew he was lying, but I chose to believe his lies. We never lived together. He made me believe it was best to keep separate houses. Fast forward to when my son was two and I popped up early one morning and found him in bed with another girl. We physically fought. He begged for me to forgive him, but I put my foot down hoping he would chase me. He didn't. It's been three years since and he is still with the same girl I found him in bed with. He's a semi-active father. He works in the entertainment industry trying to get ahead and this keeps him from seeing his son consistently. He barely calls him and now has moved the girlfriend into his house. I'm having a hard time knowing what's right for me and my son. On one hand, my jealousy is still on fire and I hate that they're still together and my son plays with the woman who slept in the bed we three shared once. It hurts so much that he's still with her. If it was a new girlfriend, I feel it would sting less. I can't get my mind and heart on board with hearing my son embrace her. I try to do what's best and I have let my son go there overnight as usual, but the last time he came home I was set off and exploded on his father about having her around him because she bathed him. Arguments always blow up every few months now that my son is older and he's starting to understand and hear things. I've even told him this last time I don't like her, which I'm not proud of. 
I honestly don't want her around my son when his dad doesn't even spend real solo time with him. They have a house together while me and my son live in my mom's house in a bedroom together. They are living the life me and my son would have had if he had not cheated. I told him I do not want my son there while she is and for her to go to a friend's while my son is over or he will not be sleeping over. Is this unfair? What can I do to get a place to a place of indifference? I want to move on, but it's hard when I'm constantly reminded of the pain dealing with him and his girlfriend. I feel I'm rightfully upset. Is that wrong to be bitter when it's rightfully so? He did do awful things to me, gaslit me and chucked me when he found someone else who seemed to be his perfect counterpart. How lucky for him. He gets to move on and have a perfect life with this girl and my son that he will repeatedly throw in my face. I forced him to, so too bad. Ashamedly, I've told him as long as he's with her, I'll always raise an issue for him to deal with. I know this is wrong, but I'm struggling. Please help. Okay, Angie, I'm really glad you wrote. Um, it's so important. Once the kid is in the picture, your CPTSD issues and the way you're handling relationships, there's an urgency to clear it up because now you are on the brink of passing this on to your child, what you went through. And it's so interesting, isn't it, how you were treated as a kid and the family dynamics of your mom getting cheated on and then your, your, your dad going off and, and um, having a kid like a month apart from you and this other family that he was with and all the fighting and all that. So you grew up with this. I'm just gonna ask you right now, are you willing and are you ready to break the cycle? And I hope you say yes, because the last thing your kid needs or the world needs is to have what your parents did to you happen again, okay? It's not a happy place. I'm gonna wager your mom is not a happy person after all of that. And you're, you don't want your son to be playing out this drama again, you know, 20 years from now, all right. So let me see if I can help you. I'm going to just sort of I come back to things I circled and mention some things you said. You and your ex met seven years ago and you liked him, but you weren't sure how serious you were until you found him talking to other girls. So for you, it wasn't love. It was jealousy. And I totally understand with CPTSD, it can be really hard to know the difference between what is love and what is just like a hurt feeling that, that you feel jealous and you want this not to happen. And you'll use this whole thing of giving your heart or even your motherhood to somebody so that you don't have to feel jealous. But that's kind of what happened. And so first, I just want to lay the foundation and say it's totally understandable that you did that. But because you started this relationship without that sincerity and act, you know, you have this very good self-awareness and insight. This is the tough love. What you were doing there, regardless of anything he did, we're not here to analyze him and people are going to write in and go, what about the guy who's going to call him out? Not really me because he didn't write to me. I'm helping Angie. Like what can Angie do? And it's to first just like own that you made um, a trauma driven decision in getting together with somebody you didn't love but your jealousy was intense. And jealousy, sometimes it comes because we're getting into relationships with people who are not available, and I think that's what happened here. Also, sometimes we get jealous because we were never properly loved as kids, and that whole thing of attaching in a romantic way to another person activates that old wound where you were not cared for and nobody stood by you when you were little. Your parents' drama ate up all the oxygen in the room. You kids were left to overhear all these horrible fights and things. I'm so sorry that happened for you. So this jealousy thing, it's not very good information, actually. It's not great information. It's, it's, it's trauma driven. Your CPTSD generated it, but it wasn't you thinking to yourself, this really is the right relationship for me. I'm going to get up on my toes and do my best to, you know, work this relationship out. That's not where it came from. So you said, when you saw him talking to other girls, it made you feel like, I needed him, I wanted to be serious. And you know that's unhealthy, you say. And you began to feel super insecure and the cycle began of insecurity, jealousy, resentment of him getting caught over and over and taking you back over and over. So because both of you were outcasts from families, you have a trauma bond, that's what you have. He betrays you, you throw him out, you take each other back, you try again and again and again. That's a trauma bond and it's intermittent reinforcement. I do think a lot of people are going to say, you know, how dare he cheat on you? But I'm like, you, you were never that into him. He was never that into you. There was a strong feeling there. It may have been like intense at first, but 
he was always sleeping with a lot of people. So if you didn't have CPTSD and you were able to date like, you know, some perfect person, which none of us can, but if you could, you would have seen that first sign of behavior. The minute he was like talking to other girls, you would have been like, this guy's not available. And the reason we can't see it is because of CPTSD and also because it kind of matches the way we're not available at stages of our life. And it might manifest in different ways. One way we manifest not being available is like latching on, clinging to relationships with somebody who's not available. So he had this constant pattern. You know, he wasn't the guy who was in love with you and wanted to marry you and be with you and be faithful to you. That wasn't it. And then he went and got somebody pregnant and had a baby with her. And then out of spite and jealousy and hurt, not out of love. And I just got to say, this is not the greatest reason to have a child. It sounds like you weren't ready at all. You wanted to have a baby to hurt him, to claim your um, dignity, I think, after the indignity of having him go get somebody else pregnant. But I think in your mind, like outside forces or he was doing this to you. And what I do here is I help people who are hurt by trauma, who keep having a bad cycle in a relationship, just go, you know, where did you make the decision to, you know, commit to this relationship? And a kid is the biggest commitment you can make. Like you, whether he gets full measured in parenting or not, like you guys are connected forever. There's going to be this lifelong connection. And I bet you didn't know that when you had a kid. I had a kid as a single mom and I had not, I mean, I feel like I should have known better, but I didn't, I didn't really, I didn't really get it. And I also, I, I was trauma driven, but also it was also part of a good motive. And I'm sure it was in you. Like I just knew that I really wanted kids and I was pregnant and there it was. So, so I moved forward and I'm really glad I did. Like it all worked out. But I had a lot of the challenges you have. It was, it was hard. It was hard to, you know, manage the relationship with my kid's dad. We had two kids and it didn't work out, but we were able to skip over all this like rancor at the end. It was hard at first. And I will tell you about this. He and I made a course. It's not really part of Crappy Childhood Fairy, but I will put a link to it down below. It's called Positive Shared Custody. And it's for people in exactly your situation where you're not a couple with the other parent, but you need to work out a positive thing that's good for the kid and happy for everybody. So that, that link is going to be below, but stay with me here. I just want to talk about what you're going through, okay? So then you had the baby and the other girl cut him off and when he didn't choose to be with her. So she obviously had a little less trauma than you and she could see that for what it was. You cut a guy off when he does that. But you know what? Now, once you have a baby, there's this huge motivation to keep a good relationship with the baby's other parent. So good on you. You tried to do that. Um, it seemed to get better during pregnancy, but he was still cheating and you didn't leave. And you know, that's what, that's what people do during pregnancy. You just kind of deal with what you have to deal with because it's, you're vulnerable. You're going to need help. It would take an incredible audacious courage to break up with somebody in the middle of pregnancy. It can be done, but I don't know if you had the family support to make that seem like a good option to you. I, I, I totally understand. I knew he was lying but I chose to believe his lies. We never lived together. He made me believe it was best to keep separate houses. Okay, you never lived together and he made you believe it was best. But here also, um, and again, like I'm here to help you like reclaim your power from this situation. And what I see here is a little bit, you, you still are endowing him with all the power to, by which your life is gonna be good or bad, but you actually have that power. And part of how you're gonna realize that is just to say, no one can make you believe that. You know that living in a separate house from somebody who you're raising a child with and who's technically your partner, you know that living in a house is a very significant deviation from what people normally do. And it usually means somebody does not want to be sexually monogamous. It might not mean that, but you know, you chose to believe his lies. He'd been cheating before. I know that you knew in your heart what was going on. And I also understand if you decided to just kind of be okay with it for the time being so that you could have his help and participation while you were in the most vulnerable and difficult part of raising a child, which is the early, you know, like the first year and it gradually gets easier. So fast forward to when your son was two and you say, I popped in early one morning and found him in bed with another girl. So popping in early on the guy, I think that was your good intuition, just wanting to not, ha not be lied to and just know, right? You already knew, you knew, you saw confirmation. Yeah, he was sleeping with other people. So he was not somebody who could make a commitment to anybody, it's clear. And his behavior is pretty much frowned upon by society everywhere. 
getting women pregnant, not really showing up to care for them, not being honest with them, not doing his share. It's crappy behavior. I totally get that. I do not approve. But again, we're going to come back to how do we help you now? What do you do now? Because he is who he is and he's not your partner anymore. And I don't think he's ever going to be. I think that's like 100% clear. So what you're dealing with now is this attachment to him and this bitterness towards him and feeling like it ought to have turned out differently. And that's what we do. But I want to help you let that go. I want to help you let go of the fantasy of a hypothetical reality where he was not who he was and you were not who you were. And if you were not the person who got together with a cheater, you wouldn't have been with him. This is not who you would have had a kid with. But here you are. You have this kid. I bet you love your kid. You're here. And now it's time to make the best of it. And isn't it beautiful how life can create whole new human beings? and bring our lives forward a whole chapter, even though all of this is being formed out of our brokenness. And that's often how I look at my kids. They're so wonderful. They're such a joy in my life. And it was hard. And having kids, when I did and how I did, it came out of like one of the hardest periods of my life and I didn't know what I was doing. And yet it turned out as a great gift. And I, I really want you to have that too. And whether for people watching, like, Maybe it's not kids for you. Maybe it's your happiness. Maybe it's the place where you get to finally live as your home. All of these things. Like sometimes life works with us. We get to have great adventures. We get to find love. We get to come home one day, you know, to a more stable life. Even though we have CPTSD and we make these decisions now before we know how to do this. So, but you're learning. You are learning and you're 32 and you asked me and I want to help you. Like I just love the thought that I can help I can help people who are at an earlier stage of life. When I was your age, well, it was two years before I embarked on my kid journey. So, <laughs> so all of that, you know, I had high hopes. I still hoped at that time I was going to, you know, have the really normal path. But I couldn't put together the normal path because I had CPTSD and it kept sort of guiding me towards relationships that couldn't be that. And I didn't know how to not do that. I learned later. I learned later. And everything I'm telling you is from what I've learned. So this is kind of if I could do it differently, right? If I could go back in time and do it, this, I'd do what I'm telling you. Okay. So you had a physical fight with him about finding him with another girl. And I guess if it was your understanding that you were in a monogamous relationship in two different houses, you know, I can understand you being so upset. But when you physically fight with somebody, you're crossing a line that's very hard to come back from. And so first of all, Angie... I want you to really, really take that seriously. And I want you to go into your heart and get all the support you need to make a decision that you will never, ever strike another person and you will never, ever stay in a situation where someone strikes you. In this situation, because you sprang up on him, you came into the situation. He wasn't being honest. He was hurting you. But, but you brought that drama into the room. And um, so the good news about that is it means that you have the power to not make those decisions anymore. If you've been in violent relationships in the past, it can be really hard to change the pattern. So I just, again, put your top priority. Your top priority is never to have a violent interaction again, unless you are defending yourself against somebody who's attacking you, which happens randomly. But I don't want you ever in a relationship with somebody who does that. If they do that, you never see them again. No more violence. You're a, you're a mom. Moms must not have that. And it happens. It happens. But when you're ready to heal, you're going to draw the bright red line on that. No more. Okay. So then he begged for you to forgive him. So I guess he liked having you as kind of his main partner, but he wanted to have other ones and he knew you wouldn't accept it. So he lied. And he, you put your foot down hoping he would chase you and he didn't. And now he's still with this person three years later. So in a way, I feel like that was an evolution for him. I don't know. Maybe he cheats on her too. Maybe she's okay with it. I don't know. I'm not really trying to help him here. I'm trying to help you. So he's moved on. That is what happened. He, he moved on and he's in a relationship that's more stable. And I hope for the sake of your son and for him and for the woman he's with that he's in a better place now. I do hope so. But it's none of our business anymore. Did you know that? It's just like it's not your business anymore who he sleeps with. It is your business what your kid is exposed to. But I'm going to talk about that now. So it's been three years and he's still with her and he's a semi-active father. Okay, that's something. It's not ideal. It's not 
you know, half and half. He works in the entertainment industry and is trying to get ahead, and it keeps him from seeing his son consistently. He barely calls him, and now he's moved the girlfriend into the house. I really, really want all dads, all parents who are not the primary custodial parent, to be the best parent they can and to be involved as they can. That is positively the best thing for the kid, as long as there's not a whole bunch of drama between the parents. So when there's going to be fist fights and screaming and name calling and threats and um, manipulative maneuvers of saying he can't spend the night, then a smart person has to find a way to set a boundary. And what I don't totally get is why you two haven't gone to, because, you know, there's like county, um, state, government supports for people who are separated parents. They will help sort out the custody thing. And a father is entitled, assuming you're in my country, the U.S., a father is entitled to 50% custody unless there's some terrible case that can be made that he shouldn't have it. Now, not everybody asks for 50%. And so normally what the deal is is, whoever has less than 50%, then they do a calculation to see if child support needs to be paid. When I got divorced, we made about the same amount of money. We, we, we really committed to the kids having a strong relationship with each of us 50-50, and we did that. And we were super cooperative with each other so that the kids, would, we could minimize how much stress and fear and hurt that they went through because of our split. My um, older son was four when we split up, and he was the younger one, he was only one. And, I'm sure he felt it, he couldn't articulate it, but the older one was devastated. And for two or three years, he still, he was very upset at the idea that either one of us would move on and find somebody new. He was holding out hope that we would get back together and be married. And it was, it was so heartbreaking and so natural for a child to want that. Kids need to feel that their parents are okay. It is terrifying to be a kid and see your parent breaking down and freaking out. And for this reason, your mental health and your emotional health is so important. It's so important to take care of yourself and get the support that you need to be okay, to actually be okay, so that your son can see you. Your son will interpret reality by looking at you like, are we okay? Is this situation okay? This doesn't look like those other people's family. Is our family okay? And no matter what you say, your kids are going to feel, you, you know, you can lie to kids. You were lied to, I bet. You can lie to them and say, oh yeah, everything's fine. And then, but you're freaking out. But everything depends on healing so much that you're not freaking out, that you are confident, that you are doing what you need to do to have a good life. And I can tell you're precarious here because you're living in a bedroom with your mom. And I'd say you have about two years to get that sorted out. Because by the time he's seven, I think that's a little too old to be sharing a room with his mom. It might be necessary for survival, that I understand. But what I see is you're 32, you have a kid, now he's school age. It's, this is your chance to get totally focused on becoming self-supporting and not needing to live in your mom's house and share a room with your kid, but to be able to have your own apartment, even if it's small, but to start having appropriate boundaries for a boy who's growing up so that he doesn't end up all enmeshed with his mom. Now, I'm super tight with my kids, and I was, I was very close to them, and I totally would have done what you're doing, but my experience is at about seven, they become, they become their own people, and they need their own space for sleeping. And starting right now, starting like today, you need to start having peace in your heart so that you can vibe that to your son. So how are you going to do that, right? So you said, he's semi-active dad. And you're so jealous and angry because for three years he's been with this woman who's now sleeping in this bed that you used to share with him with your son. So I understand the jealousy that you wanted that, but I'm going to point out again, this is not somebody you ever loved. I don't think he was ever the right person for you. And isn't that cool how in life you can still have a baby even when you're with the utterly wrong person? And then you have to work things out on a practical level as parents. That's the right thing to do. So the right thing to do here. It's been three years. It is time to accept that he's in a new relationship. That's who he lives with. And in fact, as your son's dad, him being in a, in a committed relationship and having um, an extra parent, you know, step parent around the house, or I don't know if a step parent is too strong a word if they're not married, but you know, she's bathing him, you said. So that freaked you out. But I think it freaked you out out of jealousy rather than well-being. What's best for your kid generally speaking, is to have a really good relationship with both parents. 
And one of the worst things you can do to a kid is to try to undermine the child's relationship with their parent. And I know you know that, but you're writing to me and I'm just going to say it like definitively. You want your kid to have the best possible relationship and the exception would be if the parent is abusive. And you're not telling me anything to indicate that he is. And so, you know, whatever his lifestyle is, if he works a lot, if he's polyamorous or whatever, what matters is that he's being a good and solid dad and he's shielding your child from any drama in his life and that he's not undermining your relationship with him. Because after three years, I think if you can't control your rage and you can't stop the destructive impulse, then your feelings about this have become the problem. That is the problem. I have some friends, I have quite a number of people who write to me and they're in a partnership with somebody who has an ex who continues to try to attack and undermine and poison. And it's a terrible, terrible thing to do. It is abuse. It's, it is about, it's psychological and emotional abuse and it will affect children. And it's, it's a sure way to make your life miserable. So you were saying like, I know I should stop, but I don't know how. And I'm just gonna say, oh yes, you do. You know how to stop. What, what you have to make a decision is whether you're gonna give yourself the, the support that you need to stick with stopping. You know stopping is right. All you have to do is stop. You can will yourself. And again, I'm gonna point you to this course. It's, it's not Crappy Childhood Fairy, but it's a course that my ex and I made. He's a family law attorney. Boy, was that scary back when we were splitting up because when we would argue and um, you know, be processing our divorce, when he got really mad, he'd sort of go, you know, you, you do that, you'll never see the kids again. And he actually like, could make it happen, or in theory, make it happen. But I was a good mom. It didn't happen. And in the end, we cooperated really beautifully. And I'm so proud of us for being able to do that. I want you to have the same thing. It's okay that the, that the, that the couple thing doesn't work out. In fact, when that thing is not meant to be, it's the best thing in the world for it to break up. Because now it's like, ah, oh, the drama can stop. And you have the opportunity to heal. Yeah, it sounds like it's too soon right now that you need to heal your trauma but someday you can be in a new partnership. One thing I did when I, you know, it was quite a while before I got into a new relationship, I dated. When I started dating my, um, the man who's now my husband and became my kid's stepdad, he did not meet them for a year. So that's what I just wanna kind of model for you. It's like protecting kids from our personal CPTSD driven drama is of paramount importance. And you can create those workarounds by just saying the kids are not gonna meet this person, they're not gonna stay over, only if it's a serious committed relationship would it become that. And to the best of your ability, I know that's like, that's may not be possible in every situation, but just commit that your child isn't gonna see you in conflict with his dad and you will never talk smack about his dad. So that's what to do. There's, there's things that you can say when my kids were older, they asked me about something about their dad that was something I had a negative opinion about. And they said, is it true that da 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 da? And I said, Mm, I've heard that, but I don't know. <laughs> and that way I didn't gaslight them, but I also didn't validate um, this bad thing that I didn't know if they knew or should know, you know? So it's, it can be a fine line to walk sometime, but I felt like that was a pretty good answer to deal with it. And they actually have a really good relationship with their dad. Their dad has remarried a woman I love and respect who's been a lovely uh, person in their life. And I've just been able, by healing my trauma, I was able to feel good about her even before I met my person. And then I have my person. Everybody really supports each other. We really got our head around the primary importance of living in such a way that was helpful to the kid. So here's the thing. Even if people watching, if you don't have kids, kids, they're very important, but they're also like a little like barometer of like, how am I doing? And so the things that you do to take care of a child and keep their life happy always has the same benefit for yourself. So if you're not a parent and you're having these kind of cycle of high drama relationships, you can ask yourself, what would I do if there were a child involved? And do that because there is a child involved. It's you, it's your fragile self who went through what it is, for, went through what you did. And so, when you, when you act according to that, I need to have peace, I need to have cooperation. And when there's no child involved, you get to completely cut ties. And that is often the best thing to do with a terrible tumultuous relationship. It really hurts when you're doing it. When you have abandonment wounds, it will feel like you're going to die. And that's why I say support yourself, become willing to support yourself. And how you do that is with 12-step programs, it might be 
therapy, it might be group counseling, there's stuff for single moms. There's so many support systems. The wonderful thing is there are so many support systems out there and many of them don't cost anything. And I think you don't have the money to do like therapy that you pay for. You can come do my daily practice. We do free calls. There's so much like good stuff that's free on my website. You can do that. Um, but 12 step programs, they're fantastic. And somehow I have a feeling that either you have some substance stuff or you were affected by people who did. And that means you qualify for Al-Anon, you qualify for ACA, Adult Children of Alcoholics and Other Dysfunctional Families. And so, yay, maybe, maybe Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, don't let the name scare you. It's for people who, who get messed up in relationships. So that could be a wonderful thing for you. And then you can get on your feet. With, when you have less drama and more joy and more support and friends and love in your life, then you can get on your feet financially. I can't say enough about how important that is. I think it's overlooked. I think a lot of the people who create literature for traumatized people, like maybe they, <laughs> they weren't so close to the edge of poverty as some of us were, and that as a single mom, it is so important to have that financial house in order. And hopefully because your ex has you know, got this career, he's gonna be able to contribute financially in a way that's helpful. That's, you know, you get to go to court for that and that's required. So hopefully you'll do that but completely exit the drama. Just exit the drama right now. A good harmonious relationship with him is the best thing you can do for yourself and your, and your kid. So you said your son is older and he's starting to understand and hear things. So this is your cue. This is when you wrote to me. Good job. You don't want your, your ex's girlfriend around your son when he doesn't even spend real solo time with him. So I'm suggesting you let go of that goal. That's actually not best for your son. What's best for your son is that he has a good and unobstructed relationship with your dad. Again, when there's not abuse in the situation and your child's not being, you know, neglected, like, you know, left outside or um, not taken to the emergency room if he needs stitches, that would be neglect. If he's just kind of like a funky person with, who makes some mistakes and is imperfect but not abusive, then you just want to get out of the way and let your ex have his own relationship with your son. It's really important for kids to have a relationship with both parents. And kids who don't have that suffer. So you want him to have that, and you need to let your ex parent in his own style, in his own style in the way that works for him. And he is in a big partnership where they live together. And presumably his partner has agreed to help in childcare. So this is actually a good thing because you are a two household family now. You're still a family, you're still raising a kid together, but it's two households. So it's time for you to use that time when your son is with his dad to go take care of yourself and go start healing those emotions that would have you fighting to keep a guy who mistreated you, who you were never that into, so that you can cooperate with him in having a harmonious two-household family. So you say, what can I do to get to a place of indifference? And I would say indifference is not really the goal. You don't want to not care. You want to um, be supportive. You actually want to be happy for your son to have a good relationship with his dad and however his dad's family sort of grows over the years. Maybe he's going to have more children. I don't know. Your son will always be part of that family too and you want that. That's a good thing. That's a strong thing in his life. I want to move on, you say, but it's hard when I'm constantly reminded of the pain dealing with him and his girlfriend. So you're, the, it's painful to you because you're attached to an idea of something that does not exist, and in fact, it never existed. This guy never was your, you know, your die-hard, committed, monogamous dude. That's never who he was. There were always problems. And so you have an attachment to a fantasy you had, and you can't make it be real, and you're mad at him that he can't make it be real. And there's an easier way to look at this, and in time, it's going to be easier to see this. It just is what it is. It's a, you know, it's a, you, it's a kind of stitched together, cobbled together relationship family that, that a new person came out of. So, so that's a wonderful thing. There's this little boy, you know, and this relationship was not the one. You can do better and you can do better when you heal this trauma inside. And you become a woman who's no longer entangled with the emotions of the past. If you've seen some of my other videos about cab light, People who have a big dramatic entanglement with an ex are not good partners and no healthy person will want to date you if they know that's going on. I don't mean to scare you, but it's just reality. If you're ready for a good relationship, it's just time to clear that up.
start supporting, accepting, and then keeping a vigilant eye and making sure your son is well cared for. But do not interfere with your ex's relationship with his girlfriend or the way he would like to parent unless you have a reason to think it's abuse. And if you do, then what you do is you call the Child Protective Services. You don't try to, you know, do it yourself unless it's an emergency. But again, I just don't think that's what's going on. This sounds like it's a lot of your childhood trauma keeping you in pain and keeping you trying to, trying to get that healing out of a thing that doesn't have it for you. It just doesn't have it. You do get to heal and you do get to have comfort. I would really recommend, like, come learn my daily practice techniques. They are so comforting. And when you're freaking out and you feel alone and all these feelings are coming up and you feel like you're going to yell or you're going to make a phone call you regret, then you can just sit down and you can write your fears and resentments on paper and ask for them to be removed and then take a nice healing rest. And this is a very specific technique. I teach it in a class that's called the daily practice. It's free. You can learn and try it in less than an hour. It's always linked on the free tools page of my website. And that free tools page is always linked down in the description below all my videos. So check it out. There is comfort available for you and it's comfort that's reliable and that doesn't have terrible consequences of messing up your relationships or your parenting. The last thing you told me is that you said ashamedly, I've told him as long as he's with her, I will always raise an issue for him to deal with. So you know what you can do? You can work that through and you can go talk to him and apologize for that and say, I'm sorry I was reacting. I'm not going to do that. I want you to be successful as a parent with him and I want us to work together for the good of our little guy. That's a really good thing to do. It's always okay to apologize. And I have a feeling your apology will be accepted. And hopefully all the adults involved will all want the same thing. So good luck. This is so important. Good job reaching out. So I'll put the link below. The course is called Positive Shared Custody. It teaches specific concrete strategies that you can use whether the other person is participating in this course or not. You can use them to reduce the conflict and have more harmony and more successful co-parenting of your kid. So if you like this topic and you want to learn more about why clinging to relationships is especially harmful with CPTSD, I've got a video lined up for you right here and I will see you very soon.